Hello, welcome to another episode in the RPG and Go tutorial series. Today we're going to be covering how to manage all the entities in our game. In the previous episode, we created a player that could move around with the arrow keys, and we did this by storing the image and the position of the player directly in the game struct. Now this is perfectly fine for what we were trying to do in the last video, but in an RPG, we're going to have a ton of different entities, ranging from the player to the enemies to the items to the tiles. And so if we were to just put all of our image and position variables inside of the game struct like this, you can see how this could become an issue very quickly. So we need a way to organize our data in which we can have large amounts of entities without all of these random variables scattered throughout our project. So for this, I am proposing that we create a struct. So I'm going to convert our player here to a struct. And if you don't know what a struct is, we're already using one. This game struct here is basically just a container of data. Our game struct holds an image and in an X and a Y. I'm going to pull this out of the game struct and I'm going to put it into its own struct and I'm going to call it Sprite. And the reason I'm calling it Sprite is because a Sprite is generally known as just an image at a position in game development. Um, and I'm not calling this player because a Sprite can be more than just a player. A Sprite could be an enemy or an item or all that sort of stuff. Keeping with the generic theme, the image, I'm just going to call image, and it's again just going to be an EBA10 image, and then we're going to have X and Y variables like before. What we can now do is we can change this, we can get rid of these variables, and just call this player, which is of type a pointer to a sprite. Now this is going to break everything because we weren't accounting to change up the way we're holding our data. And so what we have to do is we have to go into wherever it says g.x and g.y and change that to g.player.x and g.player.y. So I'm just going to copy this and paste this wherever I see that. Additionally, we no longer have this player image variable here. Instead, it's g.player.image. And then wherever we're creating our game object here, we no longer have these fields. Instead, we just have a player field, which we can then uh, create a new sprite for. And then the image is the player image. The X is, I don't know, 50. And the Y is, I guess, also 50. Now, if we ran this code, we will see that we have absolutely no changes from the previous episode. I can still move my player around like before. Now, you might be asking, why would I even bother with this? I haven't really made it any cleaner, I've just moved the code into its own little object. And the real benefit is only seen whenever you have a lot of different sprites. So I'm going to create a slice, which is just a continuous list of items, and I'm going to make it of type of pointer to sprites. And this can basically represent like all of the sprites in our game minus the player. What we can then do is that we can actually uh, loop over the sprites and draw them. So I'm going to do that inside of our draw method of our game. So now I'm just going to draw them all on the screen. So I'm going to create a golang for loop by doing this for underscore comma sprite colon equals range g dot sprites. And this will just loop over our sprites and capture each sprite um, like this. And then we can do ops.geometry.translate and we'll do sprite.x, sprite.y, and then we'll do a screen.draw image. And then I will do uh, sprite.image. And I'm just gonna copy this code here because we want to crop the same part. And then I'm going to say, pass in the ops there. And then I'm gonna say ops.geometry.reset. And this will basically just reset our translation back to zero so that when we're drawing the next entity, it's at the correct spot. I also have to do that up here as well. Now we should be able to draw every single additional sprite that we add to our struct. But of course, in order to actually see that, we need to add those. So I'm going to go into where we're constructing our game and I'm going to add some sprites. So for our sprites field, I'm going to create a new slice of type pointer to sprite and I'm going to add some entries. So I'm going to add a new sprite entry. Um, again, I'm just going to probably copy over this and uh, tab that over and that's a new sprite. Um, and it's going to give us a little warning here saying redundant type from array. And basically it just means we're already saying it's a sprite up here. There's no point in doing this. It will just know to do that. I'm gonna move this over so that we can actually see what, that we have a new sprite. And I'm gonna create like three of these, I guess. I'll make this one at uh, 150, 150. And I'll make this one at uh, 75, 75. And so what we should see is we should see our player as well as three additional sprites. And so boom, we have our player here and then we have three more sprites on the screen. They don't have any functionality, but they are on there with minimal code. 
So hopefully you can see the benefit of this approach. While it is a little bit more overhead if you want to just have one sprite in your game, if you want to have multiple, instead of having to do all of this code to draw each individual one, so if we had 10 of these, I would need 10 individual draw calls like that. Instead, we can just loop over our sprites and draw them. Now to make this a little bit more fun, I'm gonna be using the skeleton sprite sheet that's from the asset pack for the other sprites. They're just going to basically be our enemies. And so I'm going to load in this other image. So I'm just gonna call this our skeleton image. And I'm going to specify that it is the skeleton.png. And we're going to use that for the sprites instead. Now if we run this, we should see that they are now skeletons looking pretty nice. But what are enemies if they can't move around? We can make it so that all of these sprites follow the player. And the simplest way to do that would be to go inside of the update method here. And let's go ahead and make another loop over the sprites. So I'm gonna say again for underscore sprite colon equals range g dot sprites. And let's create a simple algorithm to make the enemies follow the player. And the simplest way to do that is we say like if sprite.x is less than g.player.x, then we want to increment it by some small amount. So I'll say sprite.x plus equals two. Well, then we'll say else if sprite.x is greater than g.player.x, then we want to decrement it. So we'll say minus equals two. What we can then do is we can do the, we can copy that over and we can replace these with y variables. And that is an extremely bare bones follow player algorithm. So now if we run this, as you can see, they are a little too fast, but it is working. Let's go ahead and shrink that down so we can see a little bit more of a delay. So now the enemies are half the speed of the player, meaning that whenever I move around, it will take them a little bit of time to get to where the player is. Now, they do all have the exact same behavior, so it looks like there's only one enemy following us, but all three of them are actually there. Now, you might have noticed something with this implementation of our enemies. In this for loop, we are assuming that all of these sprites are enemies, and this isn't always true because we're going to have a lot of different types of entities, some of which won't want to follow the player. And so now comes the question, how do we organize it in a way so that we can basically filter out only the enemies that we want to actually follow the player and everything else will basically just not be there? Well, one solution is to have a property inside of our sprite here. We could say like follows a player and make this a Boolean. And then what we could do is we could go into our sprites here and then for like two out of three of them, I'll say follows player and I'll set it to true and it will be default, it will be false by default for the other sprites. Then what we could do is we can go into our sprite for loop here and we can say if sprite.follows player, cut this code out and paste it in here. And now you can see that only one of these sprites is following the player. I accidentally set the second one to false. If we set this to true, now you'll see that only two out of three of the sprites are following the player. The other ones where follow a player is set to false are no longer acting on that. But there is an issue with this approach and that is wasted data. If you remember, the player itself is a sprite. And so now the player has this random property follows player, which it's set to false. But of course the player doesn't follow itself. The player is the player. So this works for our little example where we only have one flag to check if we want to follow the player or not. Uh, but in a game, there are a lot of different ways to sort of check your entities. And uh, whenever we add more things like, I don't know, can attack player, or let's say, what about can attack enemies? Now we have all these properties that the enemies won't all use and the player won't all use. And it might not be the right solution to just shove all of them inside of one greater sprite struct. So now what is the solution? We want to have the common functionality of our sprite where we can draw an image at a position, but we want to have custom properties for different types of entities inside of our game. Well, one solution that we could use is a feature in Go called struct embedding. So what we could do is we could pull this follows player out of the sprite struct. We could then create a new struct called enemy. And then we could actually embed sprite. And the way we do that is we just say enemy has a pointer to sprite, but we don't say like sprite here. We just embed it here. And now if we hover over the enemy, you'll see that it will say embedded fields and it will give us the image X and the Y. And this actually checks out. So if we were to change this game struct to um, 
you know, a bunch of pointers to enemies, we could then actually say, like inside of our for loop here, we could say sprite.x, and you can see that it has this field. It has also image, and it has y. This is one of the neatest features of Golang that make it really, really powerful for these type of interactions. And so now what we could do is inside of our enemy struct, we could just put that follows player back. So follows player, boolean, and now the enemy has this property, but the regular sprite struct does not have that functionality forced onto it. We keep the purity of just having an image at a position and only add on the custom property when we need it. This means that our player will not be able to follow itself and only the enemies will have this functionality. Now, before we actually test this out, we need to change the way we're initializing our game to now take in a slice of enemies. And we need to change the way we're initializing our enemies to um, create a new inner sprite object with all that data and then set true or false for the second parameter. I'm gonna just copy this over for a couple of these and let's see if this works out. I'm gonna make one of them true, one of them false, and I'm gonna set this one to 150, 50 here. Let's see what happens. So as you can see, we now have this uh, skeleton here. It's now following us around, but the other one is no longer following us around. Cool stuff. It's at this point that I would now change this list of sprites to be called a list of enemies, since they are now all considered enemies. This of course will cause our game to break a little bit. We have to change our for loops to say um, enemies here and enemies here. Just being a little bit more descriptive in our variable namings. Why don't we keep this up? Why don't we do one more example to really show how this approach can make things really, really nice. Um, I have this little image that I've imported from the asset pack that's just a heart potion. And why don't we add a new item that's a heart potion that will add health to our player. So I'm gonna create a new struct and I'm gonna call this our potion. And this struct is going to embed our sprite, but it's also going to have another field that's going to be like amount heal. And this is going to be, um, let's see, an unsigned integer. Um, and this will be our potion. Now what we can do is inside of our game struct, we can make a new list of potions. And I'm gonna say they're of type of pointer to potions. And we can also load in that potion image. So I'm going to load it in here. I'm going to say a potion image, and then I'm going to say mine is called potion.png. Now what we can do is below sprites, I'm going to say our potions is equal to a new slice of pointers to potions. And I'm going to paste in a couple implementations. So I'll create a new potion object here and it, I will embed a new sprite object, which will for the image will be the potion image. For the X, I will say it is at uh, 210. And for the Y, I will say it's at 100. Now we also need to add that other field, which was called um, amount heal. I'm going to say that this potion heals you for one health. We also have to change the other field to enemies, as I stated before, and then we can remove um, some of the things like removing this redundant um, duplicate potion name. Okay, and then one more thing we have to do finally, this is the last thing we have to do to get potions in our game. We can just copy our draw code for our enemies and change this to our potions, and we can now draw all of our potions. So as you can see, we now have a little heart potion over there and we don't have anything you know, set up for this yet, um, but let's go ahead and just make a very, very simple example where let's say like if the player's X position is greater than the potion's position, then we wanna pick up the potion and add health to the player. So there would be two steps to this. The first thing is the, the player needs to be able to actually have health. And so what we'll do is we'll say type, we'll create a new struct for our player and I'm gonna call this a type player and this is again just going to embed the sprite and it's going to have a health value here. I don't ever want the health to be below zero, so I'm using an unsigned integer for that. Basically meaning that it can't go negative. Now what we can do is we can replace our player with a player object here. And then whenever we are initializing our player, we need to now change this to be a player here and then put all of our sprite initialization inside of there. And then say our health is equal to, let's say three. Now what we can do, is inside of our update code, we'll just loop over our potions. So I'll say for underscore potion colon equals range g dot potions. And let's just do that simple check where it was if the player was to the right of the potion, then pick it up. Not exactly good collisions, but we can kind of fake it for now. Now what we can do is we can just say like, let's see if player g dot player dot x is greater than potion dot x, then what we can do is we can do uh, g dot player dot health plus equals potion dot amount health. 
and then we can print out the new player's health. So format dot printf. Um, let's see, picked up potion, and then I'll say the health is now, and then it's a percentage d for a uint, I think, um, and then a new line character, and then I will say g dot player dot health here. Okay. So now what we can do is we can do go run dot. And everything works, works as normal, but if we go past this potion, we are getting a lot because I forgot that we don't actually remove the potion. So it seems like we just get we pick we're picking up a lot of potions right now. So yeah, that was about all I could possibly fit inside of one video for how we're going to manage our entities for this game. Now we're gonna have a much more elaborate system by the end of this with unique enemies and unique potion effects and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but for now, this is a great base that we can work off of. Now just one thing that we will be fixing for sure is our draw code. You saw that there's a lot of duplicate code whenever we are drawing different types of entities like potions and enemies, it's the exact same code. That will be fixed in the future, trust me. I just didn't really have time for that in one video. Um, but with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you learned something new. This was a big information dump, so if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments and consider joining me on Discord where I can help you a little bit better on there. Um, also consider supporting me on Patreon so I can continue making videos like this. Thank you very much for watching. Have a good day. See ya.